<laughs> Here it comes. <laughs> One more time. Oh yeah. One, two, three. Oh, oh. Sound check. Hi, Kirk. <laughs> okay, so. Oh. So, Bruce, what is the culture that persists? What is the enduring element that withstands time? <sighs> Well, everybody's looking to get better at fly fishing, spade fishing, whatever, however you want to call it, uh, steelheading. Actually, hang on, hang on. Let's, yeah. let's, I, answered, I actually, actually asked that question wrong. Okay. Sure. It's a two-part question. You got to make it as simple as possible for me, Kirk, because <laughs> I'm a fucking idiot. <laughs> what is it? Uh, you can put that in the movie if you want. <laughs> Small letters, big words. Yeah, exactly. Or big words. <laughs> Small letters. No, so, whatever. Uh, yeah, that's what it is. Small words, big letters. Yeah. Okay, this is the actual thing. There's okay. Two questions. But the first question is, what is the culture that persists in fly fishing? To you. To me. For me, it's always trying to get better, uh, learning from people that are better, that started early on in my fly fishing career. I always sought out people that were, you know, in the beginning it was easy, but uh, after a while, I remember going to a, a fly casting course and uh, I used to practice so much it was crazy. And I watched as many videos back in VHS, VHS days as possible. And I went to this casting course and the guy went back to the guy at the store and told him to give me my money back because I was showing him stuff that I had learned in videos. So, um, yeah, just everybody's trying to get better, you know. Um, yeah, like even back in the day, like, you know, you think of guys like Sid Glasso or, you know, just the real creme de la creme guys in fly tying or fishing. 
they were writing letters to each other. If you remember what actual letters are on paper and send them with stamps and everything. And uh, yeah, the same thing persists today. Like I get emails from people, you know, asking me questions and stuff. And I encourage that. I encourage people to contact me on social media and, and seek out. If I can help them, I can. And if not, I'll send them somewhere else that, that will be able to answer their questions or help them with their issues. And um, yeah, I, I think that that's a real, a real deal thing. So that would be a key part of the culture to you is that the passing down of knowledge? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's a long-winded way of saying that, but for sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Sure. How do you think today went? Uh, I think we got some great footage. Fishing kind of sucks right now. I'm not trying to be negative. I'm just <laughs> stating it how it is. Yeah, it's still got some high water and uh, yeah. we've had some pretty rainy days. At least the, the river's clearing up though. Yeah, it is clearing up. That's pretty um, nice. For Good me, thing. The, the fish are just busy resting up after doing their thing or still doing their thing. And it's a good thing we weren't here for the fishing. Yes. It's all about casting and showing off Patagonia boots and exactly. Sims boots and being cool and Pinos. Pinos. It's all about Pinos. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely all about Pinos. Oh. It's hard to care if you catch fish when you're in a place like this. I know. I mean, I'm it's so fucking spoiled. It's not even funny. Yeah, it's just a bonus. Yeah. <laughs> Water came up quite a bit while we were out. This is still interviews, part two, and drop my stuff. Okay, so I'm gonna ask this question properly. So, to add some details to that bigger picture question, the major elements of culture are often thought of as the symbols, the artifacts, the language, and the values. They allow for effective social interaction between the different people in that culture, in this case fly fishing, and also influence how people perceive that culture. What do you think of that statement? Do you think of it as a statement of truth or a statement of a question? 
or do you have anything to add? Uh, I would say that's a statement of truth. Uh, the access to social media has changed the culture drastically. Uh, the access to the information has changed everything drastically. Uh, so, like as an example, it took me 20 years before I felt like I knew anything about fly fishing. But nowadays, if you're really into it, as much as I was from the very beginning, uh, within a couple of years, you could be quite advanced just by that information. Now, there's a lot of different ways that social media has gone. Like, um, you know, it's, it's interesting that the less fish there are, the more people are into fly fishing now or spay fishing or whatever you want to call it. Um, and again, that's social media has kind of pushed that, uh, you know, at, at certain points in time, like say when a river runs through it came in, everybody, you know, got into fly fishing <laughs> and then there was a huge boom. And then the people that really loved it stuck with it. And then the people that didn't, they went back to golf or whatever. Right. Uh, and nowadays with the, the type of social media that we have with Instagram, Facebook, yada, 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 um, it's a slower type of boom that happened, but it's more consistent. And, uh, a lot of people that might've fallen out of it are sticking with it because of that constant movement of social media constant contact uh, content um, but yeah the culture definitely has changed what would you consider a fly fishing artifact to me it would be something like this an old reel uh, you know that's seen a lot of wear and tear and uh, seen a lot of fish seen a few people most likely you know um, like I, I love old reels. They're not super practical compared to the new stuff, but I just love using them. Yeah, how about that? So you want me to talk or? Yeah, now you can talk. Okay. So just getting set up here. We're uh, in uh, not the most ideal conditions. It's a little bit dirty. It's going to get much higher than this. Uh, this island eventually will be completely covered in water. <laughs> Amazingly enough. Um, so right now I'm just rigging up what I regularly use on the river here. It's a 16 foot nine weight. It's what I call my trout spay rod. And uh, if you look at the size of the river, you'll understand it's more about getting out to the fish than pandering to the size of the fish. Right tool for the right job. Trout spays are great in little streams, but on a river like this with uh, high wind and whatnot, you're not gonna do very well with a little trout spay. That's the reason for what I use. Definitely a product of my environment. Uh, the further you can cast here, the better you will do. So let's head up to the top of the run and see what we can do.
I was actually just looking up the definition of culture to make sure that we were on the right track. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so part two now. What is the enduring element that has withstood time in your time in the fly fishing world? Something that's always been a constant. Uh, a few different ways I could go with that, but one, one of the things that uh, I learned early on, and this, well, one of the things that I learned early on was that uh, to spend the money on the best, like spend as much as you can on the best quality equipment because you save money in the long run. Well, I mean, that would be, that is for you, it's always been, you learned quick to buy good gear. Yeah. Because good gear spends the life with you and builds memories with you. Yeah, it. exactly. Yeah. Okay. But it's not just gear. It's um, instruction. Good instruction is something, you know, every fly shop has always offered like fly tying classes and fly clubs that, that try and promote, you know, to, to help people get better. It's, it's the thing about fly fishing is you can never learn it all. There's no freaking way. Like I've probably forgotten more than I've learned, but, but you will never learn it all. So that's what keeps it interesting. It's, it's exciting because there's always something new to learn and you can learn from everybody, a rank beginner to somebody who's been doing it for, you know, 50 years. There's always something to learn magnifier thing because uh, I had taken some pictures of a fly that I tied to put on Instagram Yeah. and when I blew it up on my iPad I was like well, that fly looks like shit <laughs> 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 so this is a whole new experience for me but anyway um, well he can be involved in it too if, he's, if he was there uh you're asking a lot for an old man, okay? <laughs> uh, especially since I just worked night shift. Oh, I'm sure you got some <laughs> in there somewhere. Uh, so when I used to go fish the Thompson, my favorite season to go fish it was early so I'd be there you know before most people were going there like most people would show up in October sometime and I used to like going early September because the weather was so nice and uh, kind of it wasn't crowded in any way and uh, so I was fishing away at this one run called John's Rock. And I was the only guy there. And there were only a few guys on the river. And I had a guy show up. It was, you know, last light type of deal. And uh, he, he wades out to me, which I thought was really weird. And uh, he's like, I just had to tell somebody. I just hooked the biggest steelhead of my life on this little riffle hitch and it was a little wet fly, maybe about that big. And, and I, like, I just had to tell somebody. And I was like, dude, that's so cool. You know, like it was, it was so weird like the, that he had to share that with somebody to validate the experience or whatever. I, I don't know, but I was happy that he shared it with me. It was pretty, pretty dope. Yeah. 
sweet ass. That's good. Beautiful. Be very, very quiet. I'm not good with a bait caster. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta keep your thumb on it. Apparently. Are you dying of thirst? I'm dying of thirst. <laughs> Make it hard for you to cast? No. Nope. Right <laughs> the anticipation was killing me, and then an hour later I found out he was just fast. So how do you think the third inning went there? Or the fourth quarter? Was it a little better? Went good last night. <laughs> Is that your favorite basketball team? <laughs> sure is. Which team was it? I didn't actually look. LA Lakers. Oh, yeah. It's just interesting that a man that's in his 20th year in the NBA can be, still be so dominant. And yet there's still people that say he's useless compared to Jordan. Oh, LeBron? Yeah. I remember the time I gave him his first basketball. Yeah. He was like, Mr. Gilchrist. Like, oh, you can call me Kirk. Now he won't even answer my call. I know. It's terrible that way. Sorry. Go back to that short rod casting in. <laughs> so that that rod and line setup that we did, I had never cast that before. Oh, okay. But it just goes to show you, like, I mean, if you can cast, you can freaking cast. It doesn't matter what you're using. And the grain weight isn't important. Like that that line was way, way underlined for that rod. It did look noodly. Yeah. Or, or, yeah, yeah.
So going back to the artifact supply fishing, uh, one of the things that I really enjoy is flies. And I admire quite a few people that tie amazing flies. And I happen to have a couple of flies that were gifted to me. Uh, this is from a fellow in Ontario. And uh, he ties in hand. And uh, so um, this is uh, June Lee, I, I think. I, anyway. And then this one is from my buddy Adrian Cortez. And uh, they both tied me my favorite fly, which is uh, Thunder and Lightning. Uh, I have my own version of it, but th these guys are two, two of the guys that I think are the, the best in-hand classic type tires in the world today that are still alive. Uh, you know, of the older people that have passed away, like Harry Lemire and Sid Glassell, uh, I've been fortunate enough to see some of, some of their work in person, and uh, it's been pretty amazing. Um, I just, you know, I like to find a connection to the past, as well as just trying to bring that into the future for other, you know, for future generations type of deal, um, so that we don't lose what is what was, what's important from what was. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, uh, a cool thing to have those flies and, uh, very fortunate that they were gifted to me. So those type of flies, that, that's what you would consider an artifact? Well, it's a style, uh, because they're tied in hand. So tied in hand means that the hook is held in your hand as you're tying, you're not using a vice. Now, I have no chance of using, <laughs> of doing that. <laughs> but, but those guys, what they can do in hand is amazing. Another guy that's unreal is Steve Zeglia, uh, a friend of mine that I met online from Ontario, or from New York State. And uh, he's been tying a very short time, but the flies that he's producing, like I think he's been tying like four or five years, something like that, but he's tying in hand and the, the flies that he's producing are unbelievable. The guy is right up there with any of those other guys, like the top guys. And it's amazing. Those guys, like, uh, they have big conventions where they all get together and they all tie once or twice a year at different, uh, different spots in the world. And it's pretty freaking interesting. <laughs> So it's a whole other deal. There's so many different categories in ply fishing. And then when you talk about steelhead and all that, it's, it's really cool. So way back when, when I lived in the East, I used to fish in the Great Lakes for steelhead and whatever, and, uh, or whatever you want to call them, <laughs> Lake Run Rainbows. Um, and I used to buy these books of all about the West, like, uh, you know, the Trey Combs Bible, and then these different river journals. And one of them was uh, by a fellow in BC, Art Lindgren. And um, I was very inspired by his Doc Spratley fly. I loved how sparse it looked and everything. And I've been fortunate enough to communicate with Art and actually take him out fishing. And uh, he was very kind in making me a couple of shadow boxes. Uh, so one of them is his, the Spratly, which inspired me. And the last time that I saw Art, when he was out here, I gave him my version of the Thunder and Lightning, and uh, he sent it back to me. He didn't really like it. He sent it back to me. <laughs> what he did was he put his fly next to my fly in the shadow box, and it's so so cool what he did he even left a spot where i have to sign it which i haven't done yet but i will eventually and uh yeah he's just cool guy he's you know been there done that type of thing he's a kind of a staple for a long time in bc for the for steelhead and all kinds of fishing in bc so let's make some room here
And back to my loop. Talk about your uh, preferred lines there. Uh, well, these are Gale Force lines. They what I it's what I use. <laughs> uh, this is uh, a setup for a client rod. So I've got here a 63 foot uh, equalizer in an 8.9, and uh, I use that on a 14 foot nine weight from Gale Force Gale Force rods as well. And just putting on a leader here. My leader system is pretty simple. I use straight 18 pound test chameleon in about 15 to 17 feet. And then I tie on a three to five foot tippet of 12 pound fluorocarbon. Uh, the Scots have been doing straight leaders forever. So if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. So one time, right in the middle of my guide season, I, uh, I noticed that the light came on in the driveway, but I didn't really put two and two together. I was up tying some flies for some clients. And uh, next morning, I go for my wading boots, and one of them is missing. So I checked the footage on the cameras that we have, and a bear was walking away with my wading boot never to be found again so all I had was two mismatched pairs and one was a Vibram sole and one was a felt sole so it was an interesting day guiding the next day because one foot was sliding all over the place crazy freaking bear cost me 500 bucks <laughs> Good old bears trash pandas yeah So other than the Columbia, what's your uh, what's your favorite part of trail? Uh, Feel free to say Pinos. Pinos is definitely my favorite part of trail. And it so happens that my clients, usually it's their favorite place to go eat. So I've had it one, you know, one trip I had guys there five nights and uh, five nights in a row we ate at Pinos. It, uh, it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> Do you this remember is my, my sister. Friend Kirk? I was here five times a few years ago. <laughs> <laughs>
That's from years ago. I was 68 years okay. old. Dad. Yeah. Now I'm 70. <laughs> Hello. I'm hungry. Trouble. Yeah, he had to throw me in. I know I cut to the right place. I wasn't going to say anything because... You wanna, how do you want to tell it? Just talking to you? So, Bruce, one time, uh, we've been to Pino's several times. You've been here several times. Yeah. One night, though, we didn't make it because it was too late. We ended up going to A&W because that was the only thing open after we had drifted the Salmo River. Yes. Well, somebody wanted to get a bunch of artistic shots, so we were running late, and uh, we were dropping through rapids in the dark and going through boulder fields in the dark, and I was worried we weren't going to catch our takeout because after that it goes into a canyon. But luckily, I was able to <laughs> figure out where we were, and we got out in time, but the only thing that was open was frickin' A&W. We were both starving because we'd been on the river all day long without, you know, smart guys, we didn't bring any food. So, uh, yeah, it was a good day. But the part I want you to talk about is the... Uh, the Watermasters? Yeah, and how well they handled the... Um, oh, they were awesome. Yeah, but what, about Except the, what about the 10 to 15 foot drop in the dark? <laughs> They managed it. <laughs> you know that section where the river I, I was on the other side of the river. You were on the wrong side of the river. <laughs> My drop was only like four feet. <laughs> well, luckily we were in the Watermasters and not yeah, pontoon boats. That worked pontoon out good. Boats, no, we they wouldn't have been the same. <laughs> Cheers to that. Cheers. Okay, see, this looks great. Thank you, Pino. Okay, well, one Thank of the you. people. Look at everybody else to take a picture of all the people. Yum, yum. I'm sending pictures to my husband. I can't wait. Yeah. This is huge. You told so, me this, but... So, uh, this is how we eat trail? This is heaven. Heaven on trail. <laughs> We'll get you a hat. <laughs> So how do you think that your fly fishing values have affected you personally? Well, I'm definitely more aware of things ecologically and protecting our resources. So I'm, you know, uh, heavy into recycling and aware of my footprint in the area or globally overall. Um, I try and uh, think about things a little differently than I would have way back when, when I first started fly fishing, you know, the world, the world's different <laughs> from when I first started. And, uh, you know, when I first started, there was a lot of fish and nowadays there's not a lot of fish. So we have to protect what we have in any way possible. So, uh, yeah, that's definitely affected me on a personal, personal note. And I will, you know, try and help people be aware of different things, uh, you know, people that are, I'm associated with, I try and help them to be aware of, of protecting what we have. So how do you think you have or could pass on those to improve the future of fly fishing? <laughs> well, I'm not shy to message people on social media uh, to help educate them, not to put them down in any way, but just to help educate. You, you've been known to stir the pot. Uh, I, a little bit. Which yeah. I, re I respect. <laughs> I respect somebody that does it publicly then rather than somebody that does it behind somebody's back. Yeah, no. I would, like, I mean, it's a small community. Let's be upfront with each other and let's help each other be better. Exactly. Cause yeah. You, I definitely get with your personality that you, you understand the difference between an opinion and a wrong. Yes. Yeah. 
A lot of opinions, but <laughs> some people are just wrong. They are. <laughs> because seven inches <laughs> that's uh bruce is referring to the streamer size required on the columbia <laughs> how can you get that lens so clean three hang on oh, please do. <laughs> okay so just look at it <laughs> like oh focusing in on you oh too funny Ready for the finger? Yep. <laughs> Perfect. I mean, my, well, one of my big battles the last couple of years is really advocating for the sport of fishing. You know, because there's a, there's, there's a lot of people out there right now that are, I feel like, anti-fishing. You know, they want the resources protected, but they also want to take the angler off the river. And you know what? We are the voice for the river and the fish. And so, you know, that is part of that, that you know, really that ethos of conservation for me is, is the act of fishing. You know, if we're not out there fishing, the, yeah, no one is monitoring the river, no one, then you lose that connection with the resource. And so, um, you know, fly fishing is about, you know, connecting with, it, it's, fly fishing is about connecting with the resource and, and having fun doing it. And, um, you know, rods are going to break, waders are going to leak, Instagram stories are going to fade away, but the need to evolve and carry on the tradition, you know, that's never going to fade away.
Jessica, just a little more. There we go. Yeah. 